I'm going to be starting with a little experiment. And as I ask you some questions and a bunch of questions, it'll be nice, though it's a little dark, but uh, nice to see a show of hands. So as I walked on to uh, the spotlight, how many of you actually thought, oh, she's wearing a green sari? How many of you? Can I have a show of hands? All right. How many of you did some age calculations and said, oh, okay, 35, perhaps 40 plus? Yeah? Okay. Yeah? Any other thoughts? I'm sure you had some, right? Now, the point is, when you are looking at me, you have noticed a few things about me, but the fact that you haven't all put up your hands truly tells me that even though I thought I was on the spotlight, I am not on the spotlight. Yeah. In social psychology, there's this concept called spotlight effect, which in simple words really talks about the fact that sometimes as individuals, or rather more often than not, we are overestimating how much people are thinking about us and how much people are focusing on us. So when you think of it from that standpoint, and then I thought of it from the standpoint of the theme today, beyond the spotlight, and it got me thinking through many crumpled pieces of paper when I was writing out the speech today, through many slides that I deleted out, I was thinking and thinking, I said, what is beyond the spotlight? And on and on and over and over again, the common answer that came up was, it's you. So it's me who is really beyond the spotlight, right? So when I'm looking at it from that perspective, I am not looking at it from the spotlight effect. And therefore, that brings me to my life story, which is really pretty much like a Bollywood movie. Why do I say that? Because I've had comedy, I've had drama, I've had ups and downs, I've so songs and dances from various parts of the world. I've had it all, right? So here's what my story looks like. How many of you would be able to guess that as part of my 13 years of schooling, I went to nine schools, right? Nine schools, no, I didn't get thrown out of any of them, right? I went to nine schools because my father was working for the State Bank of India. He was in a transferable job, and therefore in cer certain cities, we spent 11 months. In certain others, we spent 11 years. But um, in all those changes, the one thing that remained common is that from every city, from every person that I met in that city, from every life experience that I had in that city, I did my own change management course. So I really don't need to enroll for one because life told me long ago that life is all about managing the change. And therefore, I was able to adapt to any change that came my way. And one of the first changes that came my way from an Indian education system was moving to an international education system. So I'm going to go back to 1989. I don't think most of you part of this crowd, barring a few, would have been born by then, right? So 1989 is a little difficult to visualize, but I'll tell you, it was not easy, uh, so easy as it is today. It is not snap of a finger that you move from one city to a, uh, another city or move from one country to another country. In 1989, my father, whom I was telling you about a little while ago, got the opportunity of moving as part of a uh, contingent which went to set up the Bank of Bhutan. We got a lot of phone calls, right? We got a lot of congratulatory phone calls. And you would imagine that you were getting those congratulatory phone calls because you were getting a prestigious position, you were getting an opportunity to do something different. We were getting those congratulatory phone calls because we were moving overseas into an international destination. Cut two. In that international destination, I reached this quaint town in the eastern side of Bhutan, which has common borders with Assam and Arunachal Pradesh, and is a town which is the size of some of the shopping malls that we have in the world today. So we had I still remembered something called the Norbu Bakery, one departmental store, one school, and my father's branch. That's it. And I think one electricity board or something like that, right? Now, in that school was when I first learned the meaning of diversity 
inclusion, and building an equitable environment. I think my first lesson from what I am today started there. Why? Because Bhutan, for those of you who might have read up about Bhutan, is a happy nation, right? So my story is not a sad one. My story is actually a happy, happy one. My story goes back to the time when my mother, who was eight months pregnant, by the way, was mortified to see me in dust when I came back from school the first day. And it happened the second day, and it happened the third day, and it happened the tenth day, until she finally asked me, saying, Vasudra, what are you up to? I said, nothing. We just sit on the floor and study. There are no desks, there are no uh, stools, etc. And I hadn't thought it important to tell her that, right? And thank goodness for the parents that I had, they were not as mortified as you would imagine. So they, all my mother did was, she went to the principal and said, can I just send a mat home? Because I'm eight months pregnant and I can't be washing her dress on and on and on over and over again. And soon enough, you had a gunny bag coming in, you had pillows coming in, you had whatever coming in into the classroom for people to sit on as long as they were comfortable and we were all having fun together. So that's Bhutan for me. And then of course, my story moves to Delhi where as part of a public school environment, I do need to tell you a little bit about the demographics of modern school. And back then, 22 years ago, now you can do the maths for my age, I was earning 400 rupees a fortnight as pocket money, and I had people in my class, my classmates, who had the privilege of having earning 2,500 rupees a week. Again, do the maths and tell me how little I was earning, but that's not the story. The story is that you will always have people who are more privileged than you, the fatter than you, thinner than you, taller than you, sharper than you, etc., etc. It's a bottomless pit of comparison. Essentially, how much you are comfortable in your skin is what matters. And how comfortable in your skin is not determined by other people telling you what you need to be. That's an assumption we make. So the second part of the modern school story is essentially to tell you that there's a friend of mine who remains to be a friend of mine even to this date, and he comes up to my mother on one PTM and narrates, you know, how they tried to bully me into bunking. At that time was the first time that Domino's pizzas could get delivered, so everyone would be very excited about having pizzas delivered to school and all of that. And he did, did all of that and trying to make Vasundara change. So she asked him the question, did it happen? He says, no. She says, then what did you do? Oh, auntie, it didn't matter. We were just trying our luck. In fact, it's good that she didn't change. In fact, it's good that she's remained like that. So it's only our assumption which tells us that it's important for us to change for other people. In fact, no one's looking for a clone. They're looking for people that they can relate to, yes, but not clones of themselves. So Moving on quickly to my story in Lady Sri Ram College, which is where I learned about feminism and equality and all of that, but I also learned to be a statistician. And which is where I kind of look at data, analyze that data, make sense of that data, and try and use it wisely. One of the more recent data points that I read was about 59% of the world population is on social media for three plus hours in the day. If those are the numbers, I'm not telling you not to be on social media. I'm just asking you, what are you doing for those three plus hours in the day? Are you in the spotlight or beyond the spotlight? What are you really up to when you are spending those three plus precious hours of your day? Right? And I'll come back to that maths and I'll come back to that statistics, but I'll move on to quickly tell you about some of the professional experiences that are part of the spotlight effect. So my first master's was a master's in uh, marketing and finance, and I wanted to become a banker at that stage. Why? Because of the coffee mug. I would say, why coffee mug? Because I had this vision in my head which said, oh, Vasundra is going to walk around conference rooms with her coffee mug in hand and do some strategizing. Okay? And lo and behold, I realized that you don't get to strategize on day one, year one of your job. It takes a long, long path of a lot of experiences to make that happen, right? So I did 10 years of banking, and then like some of you would uh, have read or heard in my profile, I obviously switched gears. 
again, is something that you don't do when you are 30 plus with a three-year-old in tow. But I did that, went back to do my second master's. I'm on the verge of completing my PhD, but oh, I'm not showing off, okay? Not for once am I showing off. I'm only telling you that if you put your heart onto something, only you can make it happen, and only you will figure out a way and a pathway to make it happen. So my son now happens to be in the eighth grade, and he was doing some maths the other day, and he said, Mama, I'm in the eighth grade. You are in year 23. When do you plan to stop studying? I said, never, right? Because it's only through experiences, only through learning, that I'm going to do half of what is the work that I want to do as an entrepreneur, which is what I currently am doing as part of Carpe Diem, right? Carpe Diem, by the way, means seize the day. And of course, as part of the organization, we hope to seize the day to make a difference in people's lives every day. And therefore, I will ask you to kind of remember this little acronym that I formed for myself a few years ago, and hopefully it'll help you. But before I go on to the acronym, have I forgotten the spotlight effect somewhere down the line? Do you think so? No. I was only trying to tell you that in this milieu of the social media, in this world where we are wanting to be like someone else, fit in, be in with the crowd, people are not looking for someone who's exactly like them. People are looking for others who can complement them, perhaps, who can add on to what they are learning. And therefore, that is the story that I would like to leave you off with. So when I thought of BU, I also thought of BU in the context of how do I make this happen for myself? So B is, of course, what I've been talking about all this while and what I truly believe in is the power of diversity. We're all different, and pun intended, it's the differences which make all the difference. Twins sitting around you will tell you that even they are not the same. Then how can husband and wife be the same? How can teachers be the same? How can X, Y, Z to other people be the same? You're not expected to be the same. You are expected to contribute to whichever set of population that you are part of. E is my favorite, which is empathy. Like I said right in the beginning, the spotlight effect makes us believe that we are the hyper-focus of everyone's attention. We forget that there's a lot going around in other people's minds, in their lives, and therefore, if they have not noticed that I was wearing a sari when I walked onto stage, it's absolutely fine, right? If they've not noticed that you walked into the room, it's absolutely fine. What's important is that you make your voice count. You speak up, even if you're being the devil's advocate, right? You, by being a devil's advocate, you may save some million dollars for a future company of yours. You may save a life of a friend. You may just help out another individual. So speak up, share, and I wish I could say subscribe, but yes, do that, right? Of course, I've been talking about you know, accepting yourself and believing in what you're doing and being this confident soul, but even the best version of us deserves the chance to be improved. And therefore, being open to feedback, therefore being open to what others have to tell you about you, it's like a mirror which stands in front of you. Just be open to that. There'll, there'll be tons of information that comes your way just by listening to what other people have to say about you. And when I say feedback, you don't only need to be worried about the criticism that comes your way. Sometimes you don't even know your strongest points, and it's others who recognize them in you, right? Now, the last one is my favorite, again. Only you can be your own cheerleader. When I decided to become an entrepreneur, I was a first-generation entrepreneur. I had everyone in my family who had nothing to do with business, and therefore, I was at my scarest, lowest self. But only I had wherewithal in me to believe that I can make this happen. So only you will have all the power in the world to make it happen. So be your biggest cheerleader. And before I end, go beyond the spotlight. Go look around. There's so much that you learn about yourself from other people around. That's all. Stay blessed. Stay happy always. And may the world be with you. May your power be with you. All the very best, everyone. Thank you for listening.